Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks to those who've joined already. Um, it's just gone 12, so I think we'll probably just leave it for another couple of minutes, just while another few people join. So if you don't mind just bearing with us, we'll get started pretty soon. Hi everyone. Okay, so I think we'll we'll probably make a start. There, there's probably going to be a few other people come in, but um, we can kick off just now. So thanks for joining us today. I must admit it feels a little bit weird standing here talking to an empty seminar room, but at least if nothing else, it reduces the chances of being heckled. Um, so the topic for today is pledge structures for securities financing transactions. Um, what it's what we're not going to cover, because we have had a few people ask if we're going to cover tri-party repo and stock loan, similar topic, but a different topic. This is specifically about um, taking collateral by, the, by way of security in securities financing transactions. So just brief introduction first. First of all, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jenny Warren, a partner in the derivatives team here at Phil Fisher. I'm joined on the panel by Guy Usher, who's the head of the team. Edward Miller, who's also a partner in the derivatives team and Stephen Burrows, who is a senior associate in our financial regulatory practice. Um, Edward, Guy and I are here in the seminar room and Steve's joining us um, online. So hopefully the technology will all go according to plan and everything will be quite smooth. Um, so just in terms of what we're going to cover, like I said, it's, a, it's an, overview of, of, an overview of the pledge structures in securities financing transactions. Um, so we'll have a look at what that actually means, what it looks like as compared to the more traditional title transfer arrangements that you're probably more familiar with under um, Jim's Liz and Jimra's. Um, we'll run through some of the benefits, why people are using the pledge structure, um, how they're using it, and we'll look at, again, the differences between the title transfer model and the pledge model. Um, and then we'll have a look at a couple of variations on the structure. Um, there will be an opportunity for questions at the end, so if you do have any questions, just type them into the chat box and we'll pick them up. And just to make things a little bit more interactive, um, we'll also be asking you some questions. So we have a, a little polling um, slot where we'll ask you questions and you sh it should be fairly easy for you to um, answer. So I think we have the first polling question coming up first, which is... Have you already used a pledge structure for securities financing transactions? Yes or no? There should be a button that you can press. So we'll just give it a few minutes. Feels a little bit like I'm a game show host. Okay. All right. So two thirds, two thirds of you haven't used pledge structure. Okay. Um, well, hopefully this will be interesting and useful. 
Um, so just to, to kick things off, just to give a little bit of background and context to what, to what this actually, what this is, um, as you might already be aware, and some of you may have looked at pledge structures before, albeit on a slightly different angle, so it's not necessarily a new thing. Um, people have been pledging the excess collateral or the haircut um, under more structured stock loans and repos for quite some time. And that usually results in quite lengthy bespoke amendments to your normal gym store or gymra. Um, so we've seen like chargebacks for more liquid assets, pledge of the haircut. Um, but what but what is new is that in 2018, ISLA, you're the industry body for stock lending, published a new master agreement. And that new master agreement, which is now colloquially known as the pledge gymsla, um, strips out all of the title transfer title transfer arrangements for collateralization and instead replaces them with um, a pledge arrangement where the borrower transfers collateral by way of a security arrangement into a tri-party account. Um, so that's our focus for today, is looking at the, the new sort of master agreement that's been published by ISDA, or IS, ISLA, um, how that works and how people are using it. Um, and there are quite a few benefits to it. So what we're seeing and what the expectation is that as people get more used to this new master agreement and the pledge structure that actually people will use a combination of title transfer and pledge uh, while they're trading stock loan and repo with their counterparties. Um, just to mention that ICMA who are the industry body for repo have been looking at this as well and there is an ICMA working group but um, to date there has been no um, real progress in producing a new um, pledge structure for repo and we'll get on to some of the reasons um, why that is a little bit later but having said that there, there are some ways you can structure it so you get the same benefit of repo under the pledge gym slip. Um So just just before we look at the pledge I thought it would be useful to just remind everyone what the what the traditional title transfer arrangement looks like. So this is a, a sort of diagram of a typical stock loan where the lender lends loan securities to the borrower. It does that by transfer and title of the loan securities to the borrower. So the borrower can do with those securities what it wishes. It can onward lend them. It can borrow them to short sell them. Um, and the borrower has a contractual right to return equivalent loan securities, equivalent securities to the lender at the end of the loan. To compensate the lender um, for the loan, the borrower will pay a periodic borrow fee, um, which is typically a percentage of the market value of the loan securities, and that will be paid um, periodically, so typically it's monthly. And then in terms of collateralizing the loan, the borrower transfers title to eligible collateral, which is cash, equities, fixed income uh, assets, or a combination of all three. Um, the collateral is title transferred to the lender, so the collateral becomes the lender's asset. The lender can do with it with, with, with what it wishes, it can reuse it, but it does have to um, give equivalent collateral back to the borrower when the loan's repaid. Um, the thing to mention here is that typically the borrower over collateralizes the lender. So in a example, if the loan securities were worth 100 on the trade date, the borrower would typically post 105 worth of collateral uh, to the lender. So the net result of that, as you can see, would be that the borrower actually has a net credit risk on the lender for the five of excess collateral. So now if we compare that traditional title transfer model that you'll be familiar with under your gymslas and, and, and gymras um, to the pledge structure, um, again, focusing on the stock loan uh, rather than repo. So on a pledge stock loan, the lender uh, lends loan securities to the borrower on a title transfer basis as before, and the borrower pays a borrow fee to the lender. So, so far that's, that's working exactly the same as a title transfer model. Where it gets different is when you look at how the loan's collateralized. Um, so instead of the borrower transferring collateral to the lender, in the pledge structure, the borrower will open um, a segregated account with its custodian. And that segregated account will be pledged in favor of the lender. Um, when it comes to collateralizing, collateralizing the loan, the borrower will instruct its custodian to move assets um, representing the required collateral value from its house account at the, at the custodian into the pledged account at the custodian. 
So you can see that the borrower actually always retains assets to the collateral, albeit that the lender will have um, rights of enforcement if the borrower defaults. Um, and in terms of the documentation for this, we have the we have the master agreement, the new master agreement, which is the pledge Jimsla. Um, but in terms of the pledge over the account, that ISLA has actually published standardised security agreements as well. And the governing law of the security agreement will be dictated by the location of the pledged account. So if you were using a custodian in Luxembourg, you would have a Luxembourg law security interest granted over that pledged account in favour of the lender. And then you would also have a tri-party account control agreement between the lender, the borrower, and the borrower's custodian. And that would basically govern the operation of that pledged account. Um, so you do have a little bit of, well, you do have extra documentation to contend with, but it, it's all fairly standardised, and particularly the Jimslin, the security agreements, are all published by ISDA on industry standard form. So hopefully that, that shows what the pledge structure looks like. Um, and as I said, we are seeing quite a bit of interest in it. Um, we've worked on a few of these structures for various clients, and that's because there are certain benefits to be had. Um, Steve and I will just run through what those benefits could be. Um, so first of all, as I'm sure you're aware, when you use a, when you use a traditional Jimsla, um, there are closeout netting mechanics embedded within that. Now, if you're trading with a counterparty in a jurisdiction where there's no uh, clean netting opinion, um, then you don't necessarily get the benefit of, um, of that from a credit risk perspective. Um, so this pledge structure can be an alternative to trading with counterparties in a non-netting jurisdiction, assuming you can get a good opinion on the enforceability of the pledge. But when you look at it from a borrower point of view, um, there are quite a few benefits to be had, particularly when you remember that the borrower on a net basis takes credit risk on the lender because the loans are typically over collateralized. Um, so if you're trading on a sort of directional perspective where you're always the borrower, then you could end up with quite a bit of credit risk on your, on your lender counterparty. The pledge structure allows you to remove that credit risk. Um, and then obviously if you're a banking institution, that's subject to regulatory capital requirements, then there are subsequent reg cap benefits to be had in the pledge structure. And Steve will go on to a little bit more detail about how that works shortly. Um, the other benefit from a, ben from a borrower perspective is that it allows you to raise cash financing if you have um, assets on your balance sheet that are not easily transferable or um, a little bit more illiquid. Um, where you wouldn't necessarily be able to transfer them as collateral under a title transfer arrangement, but you can grant security over them. And we've seen some clients quite interested in that, on, in that perspective. So you can see there are quite a few benefits from the borrower, um, which raises the question, what's in it for the lender? Um, and apart from a couple of operational benefits where it doesn't have to manufacture dividend payments back to the borrower because the lender doesn't actually receive the collateral on a title transfer basis. Um, it is, it's pretty clear that aside from the agent lenders, where there are specific benefits that Edward will touch upon later on, a lot of the benefits on the borrower side, and it raises the question as to whether lenders will then ramp up the borrow fee in order to compensate themselves for the fact they're not receiving the collateral assets in and able to earn a return when they onward lend them. So now I'm going to pass over to Steve, who'll go into a little bit more detail on the red cap benefits. Yeah, over to you, Steve. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, yeah, so so as Jenny mentioned, so one of the the main purported benefits of the uh, the pledge Jimsla structure is is it provides the the borrower with with greater regulatory capital benefit. However, a lot of the literature doesn't really go into exactly where that benefit derives from. So we thought it would be helpful to just set out in a bit more detail where the benefit derives from and just to do a basic example calculation just to show kind of the extent um, of, of the benefit. So under the traditional title transfer Gemsler, the, the return of equivalent collateral at the end of a stock loan uh, 
represents a, a claim that the borrower has against the lender for the return of, of that collateral. And this is this therefore is, is an asset and an exposure of, of the borrower. So under um, kind of risk-based regulatory capital frameworks, uh, this, this gives rise to uh, a credit risk that the borrower has on the lender and that therefore needs to be risk weighted and then translated into a known funds requirement. So it translates into a, a minimum amount of capital that the borrower has to, to hold with respect to that exposure. And um, now that can be mitigated, this exposure by treating the loan securities as, as collateral and recognizing the effects of, of bilateral netting in the, uh, the closeout netting mechanism set out in the Gemsler. But as Jenny mentioned, stock loans and repo are generally typically over collateralized. So even where uh, you do have this ability to recognize the loan securities as collateral and netting, there's still an overall net exposure that the, the borrower has to the lender. So if we contrast that with the pledge Gemsler, because the borrower retains title to, to its collateral, it simply transfers it from one custody account to another. The borrower in this instance now doesn't have any credit risk uh, with respect to the lender, and therefore there is no credit risk own funds requirement that derives from the return of the equivalent collateral. However, this, this is only, of course, relevant where the borrower is actually subject to risk-based regulatory capital requirements, such as those under uh, the capital requirements regulation or the upcoming uh, investment firm's prudential regime. So this is really only relevant where you have um, a credit institution, so a bank or, or an investment firm. Asset managers who are you know, the typical users of these types of stock loan arrangements, whilst they are subject to regulatory capital requirements, they generally won't be so-called risk-based requirements. So they won't require them to, to uh, calculate a known fund requirement for things such as market risk and credit risk. So an, an example of that would be for uh, asset managers that are subject to AIFMD. In the UK, they'd be subject to um, IPRUIM 11 in the UK, which is not a risk-based requirement. Uh, can the next slide, please? So I've, on this slide, we've now set out a kind of a, a simplified example. So if we assume we have a borrower that's subject to the capital requirements regulation that adopts the, the so-called financial collateral comprehensive method and uses the, the, uh, the, supervisory, the supervisory volatility adjustments set out in, in CRR. Uh, if we take an example where the borrower borrows $100 worth of, of equities and provides uh, 105 of collateral under uh, a traditional title transfer Jimsler arrangement. So as we mentioned, the borrower has an exposure of $105 to the lender, but this is subject to the credit risk mitigation allowances that are set out in, in CRR. So CRR allows you to treat the equities received, so the 100 of, of equities in this example, as a type of funded credit risk mitigation and it also allows you to recognize the closeout netting mechanics under the Jimsler as, as credit risk reducing. So what CRR requires you to do is to calculate a, um, a fully adjusted exposure value. And what that represents is effectively the exposure value that the borrower has taking into account all the different credit risk mitigation techniques. So the way this, this works in CRR is that you determine the value of your exposure um, net uh, gross of any credit risk mitigation. So this would be the, the 105 and you subtract from that the securities or cash that has been received. So that would be the, the 100 of, of, secure, of equities that have been borrowed under the loan. And then you establish what the net position the borrower has in each security by, by looking at the securities that have been lent subtracted from the securities that have been borrowed. And you have to look at this for each each type of security, including the um, the collateral that's part of the of the closeout netting arrangements. So in this case, the borrower would have a position in the loaned equities, and it would also have a position in any non-cash collateral. And then you apply the uh, volatility adjustment set out in CRR to that um, 
to that net position in each security. Uh, there are also adjustments that need to be made if there are FX mismatches, but for the purposes of this, this example, we'll, we'll just ignore those and treat everything in, in dollars for simplicity. Uh, next slide, please, Jenny. So the volatility adjustments that apply to the securities, they're, they're set out in CRR, uh, so they're, they're very prescriptive. However, they're set based on the nature of the securities, how, how um, volatile they're expected to be, how, um, how good the credit, credit quality is, the, the maturity, et cetera. And for stock loans, there's uh, an assumed 10-day liquidation period. So that's the, uh, the period that needs to apply when you're dealing with traditional stock lending. So once you've run through the, the calculation, uh, and you, you obtain this fully adjusted exposure amount, you then have to uh, risk weight it by applying the, um, the standardized or the internal models approach in CRR, and that is then feeds into your own funds calculation. And the result of this calculation effectively represents the amount of own funds saving that you're making by adopting the pledge structure, because now under the pledge structure, that credit risk uh, is, is now that you would have with the traditional title transfer arrangement is now no longer in place. So the table at the bottom of the slide there, what that does is effectively illustrates um, what the adjusted exposure amount would be for different combinations of, uh, for instance, if you were if you were lending main index equities versus other equities and where you have cash versus short-term government debt as, as the collateral. So you can see that the exposure values can be as much as uh, $31.75, or it could be as small as, as $20.75. And so the risk-weighted version of, of that exposure is then how much own fun funds you would not have to hold with respect to the, the pledge equivalent of that, of that stock loan. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so I'm now going to hand over to, to Guy, uh, who's going to talk about the structural and legal differences of the, the pledge and title transfer arrangements. Everyone, uh, my name is Guy Usher, and yeah, I'm just going to talk through some of the structural differences, practical differences, and some of the legal uh, issues, the differences. So some of these are very straightforward and perfectly obvious, and they're just repeating what's been said to a degree, but um, I'm just going to try and pull out some additional some additional points on them. Um, the first thing to note is that um, the pledge Gamisla is a one-way document. It assumes that one party is lender and one party is borrower, and there's only one uh, pledge or. Um, now, it can be done on a two-way basis, uh, as the title transfer Gamisla and Gemma and so on do, uh, but in practice, we only really see it used other than on a trade specific basis where it's worthwhile um, to do so, which tends to be more where you've got a big lender. So the lender might be an insurance company, it might be a pension scheme, it's sitting on piles of long equities or whatever, and it's earning, a, earning an additional spread by its custodian uh, lending those out uh, on its behalf as agent. And then in that context, it, it, can, be, it can be worthwhile putting this structure in place. So base, second basic point, really, obviously, the borrower transfers title to the collateral to the lender uh, versus the borrower retains title to the collateral. I mean, it means that the borrower still, in all cases, has title to the loan securities, which is often a very important factor because the borrower, if it's a broker dealer, may well be on lending that to a hedge fund or, or other party who wants it, either to short the position on the equity or to exercise voting rights or something similar, corporate actions. Um, and, the, and the collateral typically doesn't, isn't needed for, for that purpose. It's really just there to back the loan. Um, however, um, particularly agent lenders often will reuse um, collateral received uh, on behalf of their lender clients, uh, and that they can do under a title transfer, Gemisla or Gemra, but under a pledge structure, because it's in, a, it's in a, effectively a pledged account, it really has to stay there um, so that the collateral is locked up. On the other hand, at least the if it were if it were cash that's posted, and frequently it's not, but it, in, in a pledge structure, but it is common 
uh, in a title transfer. You know, in that situation, the uh, lender does have to earn a return in order to pay interest on the cash, assuming interest rates are not negative. Um, but it will have to therefore reuse that collateral so that it received cash. The lender might repo that, reverse repo that cash out to generate a return in order to compensate the borrower the, uh, for the use of that cash. Whereas that really doesn't arise uh, in a pledge structure, so that, that flow is missing. There's an obvious difference, therefore, on, on voting rights and corporate actions. As I've said, these will flow on the loan securities if that's the purpose of the borrow, um, because they do transfer outright, but they won't transfer on the collateral. So less, uh, therefore, for the lender to do because the borrower will can retain those, uh, at least retain those within reason. So you do need to be a little bit careful that the borrower hasn't got uh, so many rights to do things with the collateral that effectively they are deemed to retain too much or to have too much control over the collateral, which could cause you some issues in terms of uh, how robust the security interest is for the purpose of things like um, financial collateral directive. The next point to note there is uh, that the obviously in a normal TTCA uh, stock loan or repo, there are manufactured payments that have to be made both with respect to loan securities uh, and the collateral. So if the collateral securities and it's throwing off coupons or dividends, you have to make manufactured payments. There are tax issues about that. Um, uh, uh, that people need to be mindful of, lenders and agents. Um, and in a pledge structure, that really doesn't arrive. The borrower, they, they own the collateral, they keep the collateral, albeit in a pledged account, so they receive dividends uh, and so on directly into that pledged account. Into its, they never leave the building, if you like, uh, and so there are no manufactured payments and no tax consequences of that. Um, there is a, another kind of practical thing. So one of the um, Jenny mentioned a few of the reasons why people do it. I do know of a client who was a custodian and agent lender on behalf of one of their big pension schemes, and they had lent out their stock uh, in accordance with this, and they had uh, received collateral in accordance with eligible collateral criteria and so on uh, from a borrower or from borrowers who had actually thrown that client's position in the equity that they were long in. They got additional equity by way of title transfer collateral, and that actually triggered a disclosure uh, threshold because they'd gone below above a certain holding. Now, I'm not saying that can never arise in, in the case of where you have a pledge, because it's jurisdiction by jurisdiction specific. In that particular case, the, the, the trigger would not have been crossed, the, the threshold wouldn't have been crossed uh, had that collateral, those equities been received uh, by pledge. Next slide. So those are like the practical day-to-day -day type differences. There's getting getting into the sort of more slightly legalistic uh, differences, and it flows from what's written in the docs and, and what's and just just how how defaults and things work. So the title transfer Gamisla, as the Gemra, um, everyone will be familiar. You basically you you terminate for an event of default, uh, and you carry out a, a closeout valuation. A default market value valuation of both the loan securities and the collateral uh, and then you're done so everyone keeps what they've got uh, and you just value the, the non-defaulting party will value uh, both sides with a pledge gamisla uh, the enforcement is slightly different you carry out the same dmv default market value close out valuation on the loan securities but then the next step with regards to collateral would be to enforce the security and not immediately to put a value on it under the terms of the Gamisla itself. So if you think about the title transfer, default notice given, termination notice is given, that will immediately give rise an automatic closeout and valuation of both legs, collateral and loan securities, whereas you kind of have an additional step or steps uh, where, where you're receiving pledge collateral because you give your termination notice under the Gamisla, you carry out your closeout valuation of the loan securities, and then you need to take a step to grab the collateral from the custodian, because the custodian won't value it for you for these purposes. Uh, so you've got to serve a notice, take control of the collateral into your own account, 
and then either realize or value it, whatever's required under the, under the relevant uh, security interest that you've taken. So there's an additional step that arguably from a sort of lender perspective is slightly undesirable. And bear in mind that one of those events might be the fact that the collateral wasn't topped up. So normally where the collaterals receive title transfer, you will receive it and it will be your custodian or your agent on your behalf and they will see the collateral come in and therefore they will see the collateral hasn't come in. If there's a collateral shortfall that's being placed into a pledged account, which is a borrower account, somebody needs to be monitoring that collateral every day in that third party account. So you need a mechanism to monitor and you need to actually monitor in case the actual event that's occurred is actually a, is a failure, a shortage in the collateral. So in the, in the GAMISLA, being a two-way document, the enforcement mechanism is agnostic as to who's the defaulting party, whether it's borrower or lender. It works the same uh, in both directions, uh, albeit to favour the non-defaulting party, but the non-defaulting party could be borrowing, borrower or lender. Um, now you could have a defaulting party in a pledge structure that's the borrower or the lender, but the way the actual enforcement it works it is, is slightly asymmetric. Uh, under the, the pledge Gamisla. Uh, and the way in which it's asymmetric is actually upon a lender default. So as Steve and Jenny have most mentioned in a TTCA, outright transfer of collateral, there'll be over collateralization with the, always with the lender, or at least that's the intent expectation. And therefore the borrower is exposed to that lender uh, for the over collateralization. In the pledge structure, the borrower can avoid the exposure to the lender uh, if the lender defaults by returning the loan, loan securities. So if the borrower returns the loan securities, it can basically just take its collateral back under the account control arrangement. So it can avoid the, uh, the lender taking control of the, uh, all of the pledged assets, the collateral. However, if the borrower defaults, the way that the standard uh, documents are drafted, um, you get to the same point under the title transfer, Gamisla, because it's title transfer, it's the same direction. Um, and in the pledge, you end up with the same spot because if upon the borrower defaults, um, the borrower is still exposed to the over collateralization where the lender enforces. And so in this case, under the standard pledge, the borrower is assumed not to be able to return the loan securities and therefore as soon as that default occurs the lender can grab all of the assets. Now you could modify that uh, to provide that right perhaps in anything less than an insolvency or just put a wait period on it but basically that that's the that's the standard offering. Next slide. So in terms of the way these things work legally from an enforceability perspective, as Steve's mentioned and Jenny, enforceability under title transfer relies on uh, effectively just close out netting. So you just net down the default market values of the collateral versus the loan securities plus any borrow fees or and manufactured dividends. With a pledge, it is more complicated. You still need to know that your close out under the pledge Gamisla to stop the trades and value the loan securities is effective, i.e. you're not going to be prevented from terminated. But beyond that, it doesn't really rely on closeout netting as such, because all of the cash payment flows are in one direction. They're just claiming the value of the, uh, the loan securities plus any unpaid uh, borrow fees. On the other side, however, you do need to know that the pledge, when you come to exercise it, and the account control arrangements, will be valid in the place where the location of the collateral is. So if it was Luxembourg, you'll know that in Luxembourg, they would recognize your security interest and it had been duly perfected. And that the account control against the custodian will also be enforceable. And then of course, as you'll be familiar uh, with, there are more challenges, uh, at least historically, there's still now challenges, but with care, uh, about taking security interest because you have to look at uh, priority issues and perfection issues that don't arise in title transfer. 
sector. Uh, ISLA has, uh, as, as do ICMAR, in fact, they share them uh, a good range of netting opinions. I think there's 60 odd jurisdictions that are covered uh, with respect to the standard GAMISLA and GMRA. There are more limited opinions on the GAMISLA pledge, and you do need more of them. So, as I said, you need to know that the GAMISLA itself, under its governing law, will be effective. You need to know that the security and the account control is adequate in where the location of the collateral is. And you also need to know that, as regards your borrower, that the, um, that the security has been valid, validly granted and perfected as regards them, that they've got capacity authority and any registrations, et cetera, have been carried out with respect to the borrower. Now, there are um, ISLA opinions on the GAMISLA and certain uh, security uh, locations, Belgium, UK, uh, Bel uh, and Luxembourg. I don't know if there's a, is there a New York one, Jenny? Not yet. Um, but there are, so there are those limited opinions, uh, but there aren't a suite of borrower opinions at this time, i.e. to address whether or not your borrower is UK, German, and so on. Is that what what would, would that security have been perfected against the borrower? So you would be expected to either obtain or to be, have the borrower effectively provide you with an opinion to, to cover that point. Uh, another difference is that in title transfer, of course, the custodian of the lender receives the uh, collateral, and so that's where the default list lies, and it will lies with the lender. If there were a problem with the custodian. That's the lender's problem. Where in a, in a pledge structure, there is kind of a bit of shared uh, risk of default of the custodian. The primary risk is with the borrower because it's the borrower's custodian and it's the borrower's assets. Therefore, those are, the borrower is the person who should be most concerned. But the lender is also concerned because if there were an actual default, it would lose the, effectively the ability to be able to claim or, or, or enforce against the collateral. And lastly, just to mention that, you know, we're all familiar with title transfer, uh, securities financing, I call it cheap and cheerful, it's a very straightforward document, it's easy to set up. Um, as with things like initial margin, for people who are familiar with that, setting up pledge accounts and having third party custodians have pledge accounts, there are costs attaching to this. Um, which does make it quite an expensive option, which is why you tend to see this only used against uh, the biggest lenders at this time, or for structured transactions where there's quite a lot of money on the table um, to be able to support uh, the cost of achieving uh, the benefits of this structure. But that was all I was going to say, I think, at this stage, and I believe I'm now going to hand over to Edward, who's going to talk about omnibus uh, structures. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, yes, as Guy says, we're going to talk now about some variants of the pledge structure. And the first one of these is the omnibus pledge structure. So what is this and, and where do we use it? It's typically used in an agency lending structure. Agency loans are where you would have uh, an agent, typically a custodian, who's got a number of, of clients who uh, typically are long in securities, equities, or bonds um, and the custodian effectively offers as a service to its clients the ability for those uh, lenders to be able to uh, loan out securities in order to generate uh, some uh, additional uh, revenue so if this is done under a sort of traditional title transfer a securities lending uh, arrangement then uh, you'd have effectively a separate uh, Jimsler uh, in place between each lender acting through the agency uh, of the agent lender uh, with a single borrower. Those loans take place on a title transfer basis as usual. And then the collateral uh, is transferred again on a title transfer basis uh, to each lender separately, although it's normally sort of administered on a central basis by the agent lender, but the legal relationship uh, is still very much on that bilateral basis. And uh, as we've already discussed, the borrower then has a uh, credit risk to uh, each lender 
for the overcollateralization uh, risk because obviously on a closeout, uh, each relationship would be closed out separately. With uh, a pledge structure, which is what's on the diagram that you're looking at now, uh, you still have uh, separate Jimslers uh, in place between each lender uh, and the borrower, but the collateral uh, is instead delivered to a single omnibus uh, pledged account. Uh, and that typically the account will be uh, pledged uh, to the agent who will be acting as a security trustee and they're holding the security on trust for each of the lenders. And then if there is a borrower uh, default, the security trustee will realize uh, the collateral and then will uh, allocate the proceeds uh, to each lender uh, to the extent of the, the, the default market value uh, of the loan securities that it has lent out. Um, and then obviously any sort of net uh, excess will be returned to the borrower as you would do under any other pledge structure. For the borrowers, the uh, advantages are pretty much the same as uh, you get in a, in a normal uh, pledge structure, but there's a big advantage to the agent lender uh, in using uh, the structure. Typically, uh, under these, these structures, the agent will uh, indemnify the lenders against any losses that arise from a borrower default. The idea being then that the lenders don't have to worry so much about the creditworthiness uh, of the borrowers because the agent is effectively standing behind it and it's a way of getting customers to sign up to these programs. But in a title transfer uh, situation with the collateral, uh, each Jimsler will get closed out separately and therefore there's no mechanism to effectively plug a shortfall uh, in one collateral pool for one lender against any excess collateral that there may be uh, held by uh, a different lender. However, with an omnibus structure, um, you would effectively be allocating the uh, proceeds of the collateral on a uh, net basis across all, all lenders. So although the agent would be liable if overall there was still a shortfall, the risk for the agent will obviously be a lot less uh, in running it in that situation. In terms of the documentation, although uh, the ISLA pledge Jimsla uh, standard documentation does contain provisions for uh, agent lending and for there being an agent lending structure under pledge, uh, the standard documentation is only structured on the basis of there being an individual separate pledge account for each lender which obviously then leads you back to the same problems that you can't plug uh, a shortfall with an excess uh, in another account so if you are looking to implement the structure then you need to obviously draft the provisions uh, yourself and that would obviously include both the the omnibus uh, account mechanism provisions and you'd also obviously need to include the security trustee provisions in order to have that mechanism for the allocation uh, of any proceeds of realization uh, between the lenders. And then obviously, because you've amended the documentation, any legal opinions uh, that are made available by ISLA will not cover that new documentation. So you need to go up and top up those uh, opinions. A couple of points to note in respect of, of this. Um, first of all, is that we talk about security trustee. Now, obviously, when you're dealing with um, accounts that are based in uh, jurisdictions like uh, Luxembourg or, or Belgium, there typically the trust structure isn't recognized, so you need to find a workaround uh, for that in order to have a security trustee structure. Um, and one way that you can do that is by having the trustee provisions um, governed by English law separately from the Luxembourg or Belgian law, uh, which governs the security interest. Uh, and then another issue that needs to be considered is in the situation of a um, default under one Jimsler, whether you want that to automatically trigger uh, a default under all Jimslers on the basis there's a single uh, pool of collateral and you could end up in a theoretical situation if you're realizing uh, 
uh, part of the collateral for one lender, um, then allocate the proceeds to that, to that lender, and then subsequently there are subsequent defaults with, with shortfalls, um, then you could be seen as having sort of favoured one lender over other lenders, which is not necessarily a best position for a trustee to be in. So that's what I had to say on Omnibus, and I think I'm now handing back over to Jenny, who's going to be talking about cash loans. Thanks, Edward. Yeah, so just briefly, we, we wanted to touch on um, on cash loan side of things because up until now we've been focused on stock loans. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, there's no equivalent um, GEMRA for pledge structures published so far. ECMA are looking into it. Um, but I suppose if you think about it, that the driver for a repo is, is usually the cash leg. Um, so if you were title transferring the cash, and pledging the um, the securities leg, that is not actually a true repo. So, um, but having said that, there are ways that you can get the same economic result. Um, and the first one is by um, making various amendments to the pledge Jimsla. So, um, looking at the diagram here, um, when you are pro providing for a cash loan, so the lender is lending cash to the borrower. Um, and I'm paying interest, the borrower is paying interest on that cash, um, and it will pledge collateral into the pledged account as it would for a pledged stock loan. Um, that it kind of looks and feels a bit like a secured financing or a secured loan. Um, now, the, the pledge gym doesn't provide for this. It, the way it's drafted is it, it only contemplates loans of securities. Um, so you do have to, there are various amendments that you'd have to make in order to make the pledge gems to work for a cash loan, but it can be done um, and we've done it uh, before. So you need to, you need to first of all, draft for loans of cash. Um, there's no concept in the pledge gems for transfers of interest amount. So you need to um, think about how interest is going to be calculated, how interest is going to be paid, um, whether or not you want to include a floor um, for any negative interest. Um, and then you, you want to think about whether you want to pr put provisions in there for prepayment, repayment, um, or providing for term loans, because of course the GEMSLA is drafted on the basis that the loans are all redeliverable on demand, unless you modify the, the front end of the document. Um, so just to say that you can recreate the economics of a repo under the pledge GEMSLA, but it, it, does, it does require some drafting amendments. And then all of the, the collateral leg will work work exactly the same. So you'd have the pledged account set up with your custodian and the account control agreement. Um, and technically, there's no reason why you couldn't have one pledge Jimsla that you, you used for um, stock loan and cash loans. Um, what, what we're seeing people want to use this for is if they've got some quite a liquid or um, ass, assets on their book that aren't necessarily easily transferable and therefore the title transfer arrangement doesn't necessarily work very well for it but but in this arrangement they can get cash financing in um, by using those assets as collateral um, and then Guy is just going to talk about a slightly more complicated way in which you can you can get a repo structure thanks Shelley. yeah so whilst you've just heard that it technically you know, with with full pledge, not just pledge of haircut. Yeah, you, know, you can't really have a repo because there's no purchase and therefore there's no repurchase uh, occurring. Um, this, um, yeah, assuming you've got a cash leg, so the cash is the securities and the collateral. There's no purchase or repurchase, but it is possible, and we we've done this um, to have a real uh, repo uh, using an effective pledge structure and it's all kind of nicely fits within standard GMRA and GMRA opinions uh, but there is a complexity to it so here at the top those are the normal flows for repo transaction purchase price accruing repurchase price purchase securities go back and forth beginning at the end in this case though the the purchase securities are actually uh, a collateralized note so the buyer actually buys uh, a or this collateralized note. Its face amount 
is the repurchase price. So that's the maximum amount that's payable under that note to the buyer at any one time. And sitting behind that note and backing it is effectively the collateral, which is 105%. So the full 105% is backing a note of, assume it's just 100, which was the original purchase price and ignore uh, accruals of repo interest. So the, the, the note is still backed by 105. You've, you've sold a note and you're gonna buy it back at the end. Uh, and on an enforcement event, the buyer is able to direct the note trustee, the note security, to liquidate or transfer to it the 105 in the same way as it would in a normal structure. Now, this is a little bit more complicated uh, because you've got a few more pieces but, uh, and, and there is a couple of wrinkles to it. Now, if you just did this uh, perfectly and you want to perfectly replicate uh, normal defaults and so on, enforcement events under a, a GMRA, you would want to the buyer to be able to enforce. So the enforcement events in the actual collateralized note would need to be uh, seller default, uh, as in bankruptcy, failure to top up collateral, or indeed any other default. So a failure to, re to return, um, to, to pay back the, the cash at the end of the repo, the repurchase price. You'd want all those to trigger. Um, that's fine. Um, but that means that this note can then only be used on a per um, per buyer basis because it would be that buyer uh, who, whose repurchase obligation was not was not satisfied. If the seller were to structure this so it created one single note class for all of its kind of buyers, uh, you can do that. But then you can only have limited enforcement events, effectively bankruptcy of seller and a failure to. Uh, ensure that there's enough collateral in the account. So those are the only events you could have because otherwise you'd have cross-contamination between uh, the seller and multiple buyers. So that's all I was going to say about the, that structure. Back to you, Jenny. Thanks, Guy. Um, so, so just before we do move on to questions, um, I'm going to relink or go back to my role as a game show host um i think we've got another poll question um so having heard our presentation do you feel more positive using a pledge structure for securities financing transactions i think your options are uh yes no or you feel the same um and don't worry there are no consequences um we can't see you we don't know what your answers are um Okay, so it looks like okay, it looks like most people feel the same. Some people more positive, um, and only four percent feel less positive. So I don't think that means we'll get Isla knocking on our door, <laughs> asking us why we've made people feel worse about it. Um, okay, it's fine. So we we have had a couple of questions through. Um, we have, yes. Um, and just before I go into the first couple of questions, just to remind attendees, if you look at your control panel on the right hand side, there is a drop down box for questions and you can ask your question in there. Uh, I'll pitch the first one at the panel. Uh, does the pledge require registration as a security? Okay, so does the pledge require registration as a security? Um, so that that's just the usual analysis around whether you've got the required level of control in order to satisfy the financial collateral requirements um, or under the financial collateral regulations. Um, so that is all um, in the industry opinion. So providing you're not venturing too far out of the standard uh, documentation, then you shouldn't have any need to register the pledge because it will be a financial collateral um, arrangement. Okay, good. And uh, I think we need Steve on this one. For CRM benefits, how do opinions address the internal policy and procedure requirements of CRR Article 1948? You're on yes, mute at the moment, Steve. I think that's a Steve question, isn't it? Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, apologies. There we go. Uh, so from the borrower's perspective, the, the borrower 
isn't relying on any of the credit risk mitigation techniques um, such as bilateral netting or, or um, other types of funded CRM. So it doesn't have to necessarily worry about that aspect of it. So from the lender's perspective, if, if it's subject to CRR, then obviously then the lender needs to rely on um, the security interest being enforceable to, to uh, for it to constitute a form of funded credit risk mitigation. Um, but in terms of what the opinions actually cover at the moment, the industry opinions only cover the the kind of typical enforceability requirements for a for a security interest. So whilst that would help institutions with their Article 1941 requirement to ensure that all the credit risk, risk mitigation techniques are enforceable, et cetera, it, it won't help you with trying with demonstrating that you have adequate risk management. Uh, procedures and controls in place. That's really a, a matter of fact for the individual institution to get comfortable with that it has in practice those procedures available and can can show that to the, the relevant regulator, so the PRA for instance. Okay, thank you. Uh, another one in from a colleague. How does the collateralized note redelivery obligation square with the obligation to redeliver equivalent securities on which a repo is predicated? Yes, thanks very much to our friendly colleague. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure if they quite intended us to answer that, or but with that, Guy, do you want to take that one? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, obviously, yeah, there, there is a, there is a, it's not, it's not a fatal issue. We do see quite frequently uh, repos on illiquid assets and quite specific assets. Um, it is a it is a character recharacterization characterization point um, that the title transfer it does occur and effective, uh, and that it isn't necessarily because securities are considered to be fungible the exact same asset, but something that has the exactly the same characteristics um, in, in order to enable you to be able to use the asset uh, and take it back. So in theory, this note, this collateralized note. The, um, the buyer is free to transfer it. It's kind of quite illiquid because it's locked into the structure, but in theory it could do. It's got title, it could transfer it. Uh, what it would transfer back is a quantity of the same thing. Uh, and of course it's the same quantity as it received, but that's the same in a normal repo. So actually it, it will be equivalent securities that are retransferred. So the recharacterization of this risk is, is very low or, 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 or zero. Okay, uh, a question has been asked as to whether or not we will be sending the slides out after the presentation. Um, yeah, that's fine. We we can send the slides out. That's no problem at all. Terrific. And um, one here, as you miss being heckled, do you know when the draw for the Europa League is out? Yeah, thank you. That's uh, I know no. who asked okay. that one. Uh, that's a, that's a joke directed at me. No. <laughs> I'll ignore that. There one. are no there are no more questions. <laughs> Um, okay, thanks a lot everyone, that, that wraps it up. Um, if anyone has any further questions or wants to discuss any of this with us, then our phone numbers are on the slides that will be circulated shortly. Um, otherwise, uh, have a good Christmas and hopefully we'll see you in the new year. <laughs>